Madden Luke's Sci-Fi Sanctuary. The year is 3013. The galaxy is scintillating in the mellow light. Two galactic pilgrims seek out vistas in the samurai future to bring forth the unity of the cosmic shaman. Opening the door of the Pantheon of Mystics, the evil sorcerer wizard powers the engine of science, seeking to forever alter the sacred balance, traveling on effervescent balls of summer fire. This week, the Highlander. In the year 1986, Highlander won the Academy Award for Best Movie Ever Made. <laughs> Which Academy Award was this? For Best Movie Ever Made. Oh, right. That's a line from Talladega Nights. Oh, jeez, I should know that. Okay, <laughs> well, we can give, we can give awards where they're due. Yeah. Oh, okay, that might be in our thing or not. Uh, anyway, yeah, we are getting into the Highlander today. Uh, this being Matt. This is Luke. In the sci-fi sanctuary. So, I, I want to get just a touch into where we first came across this film, because something kind of blew my mind here. So, for me, um, my dad was a big fan of this film. Had it on tape. Obviously, growing up in the UK, Queen was a big deal, and my family all loved Queen. So Highlander was like alongside Flash Gordon. It's just like, you got to like this film. It's a Queen film. <laughs> so like, uh, yeah, I don't think I'd watched it in maybe 20 years. <laughs> but I do remember watching it as a kid. And there were little bits in it which came back to me. Yeah. So when I was growing up, I, I remember seeing the TV show, the spinoff, The Legend Continues. Um, I, I could appreciate it was okay, but like it was either before TNG or after TNG. So I was either impatient to see right. Or, but then I guess uh, this fa the fandom of this movie is so large. When I watched it this last time, I realized it's the first time I've actually watched this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually not seen it before. That's happened a few times on this podcast, but it's always been me. Yeah, it's so never it's, been you. So I'm kind of that's heartening a little bit. But yeah, this one's definitely very deep in the sci-fi wheelhouse. It does have a notable fandom. So. Um, we have a guest this week, and it came across a little differently because a few months ago we, we talked to the Mission Log guys um, uh, for Wrath of Khan, and, and when one of them told us his age, we're like, no way, Norman. He was, yeah, yeah, he yeah, yeah. yeah I couldn't was, believe it for a second. So I was like, I, and he's a Highlander guy, so I, I invite him. He was like, no, 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 I'm not the person to talk to, and I, I have the person to talk to. So we have the person to talk to here. He, he is a... Um, an arts journalist. Um, something I just I, I noticed is he's written some books on Tremors, which is awesome. And more nice. recently, he's done a book on the Highlander, which is a kind of magic, the making of the original Highlander. I believe it's, as of this recording, it's out in the UK, but not America quite yet. But uh, this is uh, Jonathan Melville. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, the book is due on the 7th of December in the US. Yeah, yeah I had a look at that and because I, I saw, oh, it's not out yet. And then I was like, I should look at the UK site. Oh, it actually is out there. So um, right. I, it should have been out earlier in America, but brilliantly, it's been so popular that uh, the publisher had to get more copies printed in America rather than just sending them out from the UK. So, so yeah, that's nice. why it was delayed because they're waiting for more to be printed. <laughs> when you started that story, I assumed it would be a COVID thing. So I'm <laughs> glad it wasn't. <laughs> Yeah. When people hear this podcast, it should be available everywhere. So um, something to check out. But um, Jonathan, can you tell us how, how uh, a little bit about your um, your trek into the the Highlander lands, so to speak? Yeah. Well, my um, so I'm I did I was ten in 1986. So I missed. I was a little bit too young to see Highlander at the cinema. Uh, so it took me quite a while. I lived um, not to give you my whole life story, but when I was ten, bizarrely. Um, the month the Highlander came out in the UK, I moved to the Highlands, strangely enough, uh, into a little place where there was no cinema and the nearest cinema was like two hours away. So we didn't see, I didn't see Highlander, uh, I didn't see it on, on video for years. So the first time I saw it was at, this, at the cinema, but it was back in Edinburgh, just to be more confusing, uh, at the Cameo Cinema, which is a very famous cinema here. 
Um, and it was a midnight double bill with The Crow because The Crow had just come out. So this was 1994, I think, and The, and the Crow was, was quite new. And so they decided to, to partner it with, uh, with Highlander. So I was kind of blown away by this, by both films, really, but in um, particular Highlander. Um, of course, because it was set in Scotland, some of it, and actually filmed here. And in Scotland, we don't have much of a film industry. It's probably really, this, there isn't one. Uh, so I think any time that there's a film that's set here or made here, we kind of embrace it a bit more because it's like, oh, well, it's, it's, it's sort of Scottish. Um, so it's, I've just kind of been a fan since then, but never an obsessive fan. Like I don't, uh, you know, I didn't really collect all the merchandise or uh, buy all the sequels on, on video. Um, but then maybe, well, a few years ago, I wrote this book on Tremors, as you mentioned, and I was kind of looking to do something else, a follow-up. Uh, and Highlander is one of the films which it just I didn't feel had much written about that first film. There's a book that covers kind of all the films in, in brief, but only 11 pages is on the first film. And I thought it needed a bit more. So, uh, yeah, so that was 2016. And I was just looking to try and get some interviewees. And then it was announced because it was the, the 30th anniversary. No, what, what anniversary was it? I think it was the 30th anniversary at that point. Or was it 35th? My, my time was going. I'm losing track 86, of time. 86, 2000. 35th, I think. 30. <laughs> 30, yes. Uh, anniversary in 2016. That's right, yes. My, I'm... I'm I'm coming up to speed now. And uh, anyway, it was announced that Clancy Brown was coming to Edinburgh. Uh, and I was working for an arts website at the time. And I said to them, can I go and interview him? Uh, and I did. And um, so I got about maybe half an hour with him. And Clancy Brown, I don't know how much you know, but he has kind of backed away from Highlander over the years. He, uh, I think he had this kind of, a, you know, he was very young when he made the first film. And he had kind of a bit of a, a well, kind of a tough time, I think. Um, with, with it and so anyway he backed away so this was really the first time he'd been talking about Highlander for many years I think and so I got the interview and that was the first one so that was where it all started really was that interview with Clancy Brown and from there on I just started reaching out to lots of other people and by the end I had about 60 interviews um, and the book is out so um, <laughs> that was kind of the longish version of how we got there yeah it's kind of a movie that has uh, like I guess a long shadow as I said, the shadow got over me and I didn't even realize I hadn't been to the source of the whole thing. So, like, I think we all kind of, like, know sort of the main beats of sort of what's happening here. But it it's not like it's one where it's uh, the first one's obscure and then the other films are mega hits. None of them have been huge. But right. somehow it just, it's entered, like, through osmosis, the culture. Yeah, for me, having, having a view, I definitely felt kind of putting in a little bit in the same box of the as the terminator of course we've got the uh you know the very terminator look for our, our, our baddie and um just that mid-80s sort of action here you mentioned the the pulsing uh sort of techno music which uh, michael came in and, and a touch of queen sort of brings into here so mm. uh, that was pretty cool as well but uh yeah <laughs> the funny thing about highlander uh, and i didn't really appreciate it until i started researching it is that it's a british film uh, and it's, you know, for, for Britain, we don't really have a, I mean, I'm going to say this, I'm probably completely wrong, not thinking lots of films, but, you know, we don't really have a huge track record in, in successful, okay, we have films made here like Star Wars, of course, you know, that is a, a sci-fi film and a lot an alien and things are made here, but not necessarily funded here, which is what happened with Highlander. It was funded by a British company called Thorn EMI. Uh, and it was only distributed in the US by 20th Century Fox. So it's just funny that, that this little British film uh was kind of trying to compete i suppose with with a lot of the bigger sci-fi films and fantasy films uh so i mean you know you mentioned it was never a huge success that's true and that might be part of it just the fact that it was i don't know maybe because it was a smaller company and um you know it's it's the deal that they had in america with with fox which wasn't great and one of the producers sort of fell out with 20th century fox and so it didn't get distributed very well in america um, and because Fox didn't have any investment in it, there was nothing really to force them to, to promote it. So I think that's kind of part of the reason it just sort of failed really in, in the box office, because if America had been bought into it financially, they would have put more money to promote it. Um, so yeah, it's just this funny little British film that is pretending to be American. Um, no, I remember seeing it on a lot of you know VHS 
shelves in the in the late eighties and then pretty much being tricked it looked like just yeah fit in with everything else so i guess that sleight of hand actually worked out pretty well it, it, it took some pretty notable legs in america on video i think yeah totally well that's the beauty isn't it of video like like with tremors i mean that was a flop at the cinema uh and video is what saved it and made it a cult favorite um and yeah highlanders is exactly the same if 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 video hadn't existed we might not be talking about highlander now because it would have just come and gone at the cinema and nobody would remember it. So we have a lot to thank VHS for. <laughs> well, let's get ready to take a, a deeper plunge into the Highlands. Can you take a deep plunge into the Highlands? I mean, they're high, you go up. Okay, a deep <laughs> jump into, a, a, a large jump. Anyway, uh, here is the story of the Highlander. <laughs> Connor McLeod is an antiques trader rocking out in the audience of the latest WrestleMania. He heads off to have a sword duel with a middle-aged salaryman and lops off his head. But this is no normal sword duel. The two are immortals, and Connor experiences a quickening, wherein he is imbued with the power of the no longer mortal immortal. He is quickly rounded up by the police, but soon released due to lack of evidence. Detective Brenda is still suspicious, though, and has a look at Connor's affairs. Time to look into Connor's backstory. He was a Scottish Highlander who suffered a fatal wound at the hands of the Kurgan, an immortal. Turns out Connor quickly recovers from that flesh wound as he is also immortal. Connor is shunned from his village for this, but falls into the arms of the lovely Heather and into the training of Juan Sanchez Villalobos Ramirez, a 2,000-year-old Egyptian Spanish swordman who is, well, Sean Connery. The idyllic time ends when the Kurgan reappears to lop off Sean's head and experience his own quickening. Back in good old 1985, the gathering is quickly approaching, during which time the final immortal will lop off the head of the no longer mortal immortal. This turns out to be a New York City duel between Connor and the Kurgan. The Kurgan tries to use the aforementioned detective Brenda as emotional collateral, but Connor manages to be the one who performs the head lopping, allowing him and Brenda to run off to the Scottish Highlands and have all the screaming babies that Connor could not conceive while being immortal. we'll do for the moment is just kind of talk about the the actors and stuff um and, and I, I just want to lead off things with um i think it was 19 1996 uh i had a i had a class trip where we actually went to europe and we had a tour of the louvre right and someone was t we had a tour guy taking us through and the most bizarre accent ever mm. and i've had trouble explaining over the years like what it was it's it's christopher lambert's accent in this movie <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the first thing they say is, you talk funny. I mean, it's, I, I, it's kind of cool how he talks, but yeah, it is just a, such a strange mismatch of accents, which yeah. really does work well here. It's like perfect. Well, yeah, because like his response to that is, they're like, where are you from? So I come from many places. Yeah. <laughs> he, he does sound like a guy who's just not quite from anywhere. <laughs> Although if we're going to talk about Christopher Lambert's accent, how, how did he do? Well, he did. He learned English for this film, did he? Basically, he played Scottish at the start of the film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Christopher Lambert. Yes, he could, when, when he went for his interview with the producers, he couldn't. He could speak maybe one or two sentences. I think they said uh, Bill Panzer, one of the producers, said he said hello, very nice to meet you. I think that was about all he could say in English. 
And so the producers were a bit concerned because they thought we'd just spent a small fortune paying for this guy. Because, of course, he was, um, Lambert was, was doing well with things like uh, Greystoke um, and I think Subway he'd done in, in France. So he was really, he was really on, a, on a high at that point. Um, and they were like, oh, we thought you could speak English. And, um, and they brought in this coach, voice coach, who was from Scotland, bizarrely. Joan Washington was her name. She, she was from Aberdeen. Uh, and at the time, she was uh, the girlfriend of Richard E. Grant. And um, now they're married. So they, that relationship lasted, thankfully. But, uh, but yeah, so, he, so Lambert had a Scots woman able to teach him uh, the, the, the accent. Plus, of course, he had Sean Connery working with him every day. So uh, I think Connery would sort of give him little tips here and there on how to pronounce things. Um, so, no, I mean, you know, he tries. I think, yes, of course it's not. He, he doesn't really sound Scottish, but he, I think he did a good job. I've heard worse. I've heard much worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just, you know, it gives Luke and myself hope that here in Japan we can trick someone to giving us a Japanese role with two sentences of Japanese, <laughs> which is about the best we can do. <laughs> yeah, the... Um... You, people always point out the fact that you've got the French guy playing the Scot and the Scottish guy playing a Egyptian, Egyptian Spaniard. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that, 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 yeah, of course, that's the thing with Connery, isn't it? It's the, it's the long running joke that he never, whatever he does, he plays, he just has the same accent. Yeah. Uh, it, it's weird, isn't it? Because not, with me, not many actors would get away with that. But somehow with Sean Connery, you just go, okay. He's, he's Egyptian, and he works for the King of Spain. <laughs> it's because his accent's not a Scottish accent, it's just a Sean Connery accent. Yeah, that's, that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> like, no one else sounds like Sean Connery. <laughs> this is it. And, and it's, well, it's, yeah, it's Sean Connery in the film. It's not Ramirez, it's Sean Connery. Oh, and yeah, I think yeah, as, yeah. as a viewer, you're just like, oh, well, it's Sean Connery. He's appeared. He's an immortal this week. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but he's brilliant, and I, I just think they were so lucky to get Connery. Because it's a cameo, really, isn't it? He's, he was only filming for about five days. And even then, it wasn't a full day, I think. And um, So, no, they were so lucky to get him because he just adds a bit of class to it and, and that gravitas thing that people talk about. I was going to say, he kind of does for this film what Sir Alec Guinness did for Star Wars, where he, he, come, he makes the film seem like it had a budget ten times what it probably had <laughs> just by being there and being a presence. Yeah. Well, that's the way to do it, isn't it? If you're... If you're if you haven't got a huge budget, just get someone in and just film little bits and then sprinkle it through the film and it looks more expensive. Yeah, it's clever. Because yeah, he only hangs about that one castle in that one costume, so it clearly wasn't a long period of filming. Well, he's got a, he's got a sly grin on his face. He looks like he's partying. Yeah. <laughs> well, apparently the opening voiceover was like filmed in his bathroom in Spain or recorded in his bathroom in Spain. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the, the writers kind of dispute that. I did speak to the writers. Okay. And they said, well, they said that there, was, there were problems with the, the, the sound. They said it wasn't the toilet, but uh, that there were <laughs> issues when, with the sound guy that went to film it. So, well, yeah, I'm, I'm just going off Wikipedia, but that'll probably all get updated now that there's a book on the fact. So. Well, that's um, it, yeah. That's just, it's a good story, and it's everywhere, that one. So yeah. it probably won't go away. I'm a musician. I, I've recorded vocals in a toilet before at a, a, a quote unquote professional studio. So <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess any other, oop, any other actors you really want to highlight here? I mean, Lambert and Connery are obviously the most obvious, and Clancy Brown we mentioned a little bit before. But um, yeah, when we did um, Starship Troopers, I was like, I recognize him. I recognize him, and now I know where it's from. Oh, yeah. he's, he's the Kurgan. So. <laughs> yeah. No, he, he is. I mean, I think he is, uh, he is great in the film. I mean, um, when, when I spoke to him, and, and in interviews over the years, he has sort of said, I think he was a little bit disappointed. I mean, the original script, I think he read, or certainly the, when he spoke to the original writer, who's Gregory Wyden, Gregory Wyden's original script had everyone, everything was a bit darker and a bit more serious. And a bit more, um, you know, he went into psychology a bit more of the characters. Um, and I think that's what Clancy Brown really liked. He kind of liked that fact. He said that the, the Kurgan isn't crazy or shouldn't be seen as crazy. He should just be seen as, as learning as he goes through the years and kind of, you know, these immortals are, are sort of, are here for obviously, for well, forever, but for so long that they're learning all the, 
the the languages and the, the philosophies and you know they're smart guys not necessarily crazy so when he was when this new script was written that was a bit more blockbustery and action film and the character became cackling i think is what the, the author the, the original writer said you know, like a cackling uh, madman um clancy brown i think was sort of saying oh well is he really is he that is he that so i think there's a little bit of a a conflict almost between Clancy Brown and the character because he doesn't quite believe that he should be what he's playing. Mm. Um, but I think he does well and he, got, and he has to do it and he gave into it and he said, I went with the madness and I just went a bit crazy in the film. Um, and I think as well, when he was filming, he didn't always speak. He was maybe not nasty to people, but I think he was a bit more distant from other actors and, and people So he, and the cast and the crew. So he would maybe disappear and go back to his trailer Whereas Christopher, Christopher Lambert was more, um, he was happy to, to chat to everybody and, and just sort of sit and watch other scenes taking place. So I think there was a bit of, you know, I think he, I think it was Christopher that said that he felt Clancy was being the, being the Kurgan right. more. Um, so maybe not quite method acting, but maybe a bit more towards that. So, but I think it works. And I think he's a great villain. Yeah, I was thinking maybe, you know, yeah. That might be one of the things that kind of makes this almost like fake out as a Hollywood film. Like it makes a few of those like gloriously bad decisions where, you know, having a very, like having the Kurgan being psychologically deep, of course that, you know, of course that's better, but you know, just that little bit of camp might be the, a bit, a little bit of the uh, special sauce here, so to speak. Well, if we, if we'd got a very cold calculating Kurgan, then it really would have just been the Terminator. Yeah. Whereas what we got instead was something very memorable and entertaining to watch. <laughs> like you hate him, but you love to hate him. He's a great villain. Absolutely, totally agree with you there. Yeah, and he does have this, these little moments, like in the church with the nuns, uh, where he's like "Happy Halloween," and then he, he licks the, the priest's hand, and uh, uh, and the bit where he sort of pulls the after he kills the, um, the sort of survivalist guy in the street in the, in the alleyway. Or it doesn't kill him. He 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 puts the sword through him, doesn't he? I think. Yeah, runs him through. Anyway, we we go to the car and he says, "Hey, mom," to the <laughs> the old lady in the car, and and it's just slightly ludicrous, but it's fun. That's it's an it's an entertaining film, isn't it? That's it's definitely fun. It. Yeah, it's all just a bit crazy, and you can't take it too seriously. But but I think we probably will come on to this at some point. But I think the thing talking about not taking it seriously, I think the thing that for me makes it last or one of the main things is the sort of the the relationship between uh, Connor and Heather so of course uh, you know it's just because it, it's it's played a bit more real like I say real I mean it's all ludicrous but but the fact that he is in love and you know his wife is dying and she's old and he's young and uh, and that beautiful music you know who wants to live forever comes up so I think there's for me that's that's bizarrely within all this craziness and the crazy character of the Kurgan and, and uh, you know, lightning hitting people and, and all that sort of stuff. You've got this romance at the heart of it, which I think makes it, I think makes it sort of last and, and, and grounds it a little bit more and, uh, and just makes it a bit different from a normal action film. Well, and the scene where she actually does age and pass away is done very subtly. Like you see them young and then the next shot she turns around and she's old. And I, I mean, it wasn't obviously it wasn't the best makeup. Yeah, anything, that, that, that was my thing. I was like, the scene works, the makeup didn't quite work, but whatever. They, that's where you save a few, a little bit of your budget when it's tight. So. Right. <laughs> I spoke to detail with all that in the book. Actually, I spoke to a guy called Nick Malley, who um, I'm sure you've heard the name. He he sort of designed Yoda and uh, worked on, on on loads of films. But he, I won't go into detail. But he does talk about how he was originally was one actress cast. And he started creating the, the mold and the, the face makeup for her. And the, the kind of almost at the last minute, they said she was, wasn't doing it anymore. And it was someone else. And he said, well, I need more time. And they said, you don't have the time. So he was kind of just trying to make do with what he had. And in the book, I, I thought it was really, it's a bit, I had to be quite, I was trying to be a bit careful what I wrote because he, he had just had a really tough time. And actually that film and the, 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 effect of working on that film and the stress of it almost pushed basically pushed him out of the film industry um so there's there's you know i wasn't really expecting to have kind of deep 
deeper moments like that in the book. I thought it would just be, hey, you know, someone created some makeup. But he said, no, it really affected me. And he collapsed on set and he just never went back to doing films. So now he runs a, uh, a little um, film memorabilia museum uh, on an island in St. Martin, I think it is. Uh, and, um, and people can go and see the, the, the Yoda guy, I think is the shop's called. Anyway, that's a tangent there. But yeah, the makeup. Um, yeah, you look at that, that, And this is the thing. This is why I wanted to write the book. You know, you watch the film. You say, oh, that makeup's not very good. Uh, you know, that wall falling down looks terrible. That fight doesn't look realistic. And I thought, well, I wonder why. So that's why I spoke to people who did it. And they say, well, we didn't have time and, you know, the budget was cut and the producers didn't want to do that and this person was, was off sick that day, so we couldn't do that. So I love all that stuff. I just think it's fascinating. And it just, I, I hope it adds an extra layer for people who watch the film to go, ah, that's why that happened. I guess uh, move on a little bit to the design or the, and a little bit more of the uh, behind the scenes, which we already got a little bit into. But um, yeah, it does have a nice sleek 80s look. Um, I guess lightning's the main thought here when you start thinking about the Highlander. <laughs> yeah, well, it does that, that one effect that every film in the 80s did with the blue lightning so mm. and everything. Um, but, you know, it looked fine and good and I liked how it like blew out fuses and stuff. It wasn't just an effect. But when the the big storms are coming in, and it's over everyone's head, that is pretty dramatic. I enjoyed that stuff. Yeah, yeah, the blue lightning. It's it's probably this or Masters of the Universe, and this is a much better film. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, I mean, I want. Well, I'll mention the book again just to say that, yes. I, I spoke to the guys who created all those effects, and and if people are interested in that final fight battle battle between the Kurgan and uh, Connor. I spoke to the, it was all done by animation, cell animation. So I spoke to the people that were working in Soho in London till late at night, overnight actually, they were sleeping under the tables uh, while they were animating this film. And, and loads of people came in from around different films and who were working in London at the time just to help out. And one guy was working over Christmas. He had to sleep in the, sleep in his office over, I think it was Christmas day and Christmas night just to do the, the work. So. But they didn't really know what they were doing, and that's another fascinating thing about it. You know, the Russell Mulcahy uh, director said to them, "I, you know, I kind of want it to look good, and I want some effects and blah blah blah." <laughs> and and the guys doing it didn't really know what they were doing, and they were saying, "What is this film? What's happening here? Why are there like creatures coming out? And and why is there? What is it? Nobody knew." Uh, so it was it's it's amazing we got a film that is as watchable as it is. I think because a lot of times we were like, "What is this?" I just don't understand it. It's weird. Well, it's kind of one of those situations where if they'd known what they were trying to get across more, it might not have been as effective because it's so bizarre and nonsensical that it is like, oh yeah, this is just some like unknowable ancient power that he's just received. <laughs> if it made perfect sense, maybe that wouldn't quite have the effect. And all that with the juxtaposition of so many locations. We just got, we got dirty New York streets, uh, you know, some... Some very beautiful shots in the the actual highlands. I mean, it's it's pretty wild. I think most of the New York streets are like British back alleys. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely some Central Park in there, which look nice. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Some of them, some of those are London, and uh, well, they did. They, they went to New York, I think, for about seven or eight days, and and filmed in the streets, and uh, and I wish there was more of that because I think that that period of New York. Um, you know, New York in the 1980s and the 70s and 80s, as horrible as I'm sure as it was and grimy, I would love to, you know, I'm sure we'd all love to have seen that and walk down those streets. Um, <laughs> whereas now, of course, it's all been gentrified and, and much safer, which is great. But I got, the, I got the tail end of that. I think uh, I had a junior high class trip where we went to New York City, hotel near Times Square, and the uh, class president went out and, and, and got mugged. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, maybe, maybe I don't want to see it then. Maybe I'm, I'm glad I missed it. But, but then, when you're walking down like that era in New York, 
I feel like you look at you look up at the buildings and you just expect to see Spider Man come around the corner. <laughs> Right. Or Stay Puft Man, or yeah, yeah, King Kong's bashing at something or something, yeah. I guess it's a charm in New York, and that's that's why it helps. They have a few Central Park shots and so yeah. forth. Um, but Jonathan, could you tell us a little bit about about those um, the the locations in Scotland because those certainly stick out. Yeah, well, um, the battle scenes took place in uh, in Glencoe, which is um, well, it's kind of. Well, I can't really explain the geography, I suppose, because you, you have to look at the map, but it's sort of northwest of... of uh... Anyway, it's the west coast of Scotland, let's just say that. Um, so Glencoe is very, is very remote, and, um, uh, and they had to, for, for the battle sequence, they had to get hundreds and hundreds of extras there. Uh, and that was one of the most interesting things to write about, was speaking to, to some of the extras. I managed to track down some of the extras who were there. Uh, as well as some of the, uh, like an assistant director who was there, a lady who did the makeup who was there, um, a guy that played at the start of the film. There's a Chief Murdoch in, in the film who stand, who's on the horse beside the Kurgan. Uh, I managed to get hold of him. So they just all sort of spoke about the rain. Um, and as, I, as we speak just now, it's raining outside here. Um, but it rained all the time for the sort of week that they were filming this battle scene. So there was lots of mud and, um, and because they, they, they had maybe a couple of hundred extras, but the battle was meant to have maybe, I don't know, six or 700 people in it. So they all had to, one day they were all dressed up as the McLeods and then the next day, and they would come running down a hill. And then the next day they would dress them up as the Frasers, the same people, and have them running up the same hill. And they would try and film it. So it looked like there were more people than there were. Um, and uh, and yeah, and, and there are just lots of stories in, in, in there about Sean Connery taking some of his uh, the photographer David James for uh, for whiskies in this little uh, Glencoe pub. I think everybody was in the cold outside fighting, and he went off to have a whiskey and sit beside the roaring fire um, in the middle of nowhere. And um, and Sean Connery was flown about by helicopter most of the time, and he was staying in a castle, so I think he had quite a good time. Um, <laughs> He jumped across else. like he was having a good time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, and there's a, there's a there's a really nice scene. The beach scene um, is filmed up near a little t- a little village called Malig on the west coast. Um, oh, the rain's fair coming down now. We're getting we're getting the Highlander storms here. <laughs> <laughs> Can you feel the quickening? <laughs> no. um, but they filmed on this little beach, and I and I went in search of the beach a few years ago, and I thought because I was over that sort of side of the country on holiday for a few days um, and went to this little train station in the middle of nowhere, walked for an hour, found this beach, and I thought, oh, this is fantastic. I found the beach, took some photos on it, walked an hour back to the station, went back to where I was staying and realised I'd got the wrong beach. And the proper beach was over the next hill, metres away, really. I got the wrong beach, so I had to go back again. So it's really remote and it's not very well signposted. But it's beautiful. You can still find it, but you, you really, it's difficult. So um, I can only imagine these film, this film crew trying to find this beach in 1985 in the middle of nowhere. It must be really quite tough. Um, but it looks beautiful. And then Sky, the Isle of Skye, which is another beautiful place. They, they kind of did some filming there on the top of the, um, uh, top of the rocks, you know, where they're doing their sort of sword training and, so it's a great, it's a great uh, ad- advertisement for Scotland, I think. And I think it looks beautiful. And, and Elan Donan Castle as well, which looks amazing. And it, of course, it looks just the same now, 40 years later or 35 years later. Um, and fans still go back to Elan Donan and, and run across the, the bridge shouting McLeod and uh, death, to, death to the um, McLeod, I think it is, and death to Fraser's and stuff like that and, and dress up as, as Connor. So... Uh, Scotland loves it. I think we we really love that film, even though we know it's crazy and you know nonsense. I mean, part of the reason I I love move, the fact that I live in Japan is I love mountains and hiking, and I come from like the very flattest part of England. So I've always said if they ever do send me back, then definitely gonna have to move up to the Highlands. They look, look absolutely gorgeous in this film. Yeah, no, it looks amazing, um, and uh, and it was just really nice like I say about all this really, just talking to people who were there and who, who built the little village of uh, Glenfinnan beside Elan Donan Castle. 
uh, and you know they brought in the chickens and the cows and all these things just for a few days work and that yeah, was great it was, it was it was fun to as a fan I, I sort of tried to almost immerse myself in what it must have been like at the time and and hopefully that comes across to the readers a little bit is what it was like walking through the little village of Glenfinnan and, and when they were making it so yeah now on the way on the way up to uh, record this podcast, I was talking to a friend. I, I told him what we were doing, and he just said, "You you have to talk about the claymores." <laughs> so a little sword talk. I don't know. Uh, I live in Japan, of course. You know the six hundred BC Japanese sword that. Yeah, that really... I double took. I double took at that, but then of course it turns out that is weird. Yeah, so. yeah, they're aware it's weird. I thought they just <laughs> thought that's when the samurai were. Around. No, so uh, you know that one attracted me, but yeah, yeah. Um, uh, could you tell us any? Was there anything special going on with the swords, or did they just have like cool props? <laughs> um, the swords were often not real. Uh, I mean, I'm I wish I knew more about swords, and and that was a, a part that I didn't go into a huge amount of detail on because I'm not an expert. But I know that um, I don't know how much you know about Christopher Lambert's sight and the fact he can't really see very well. He's very myopic. And um, in some of the behind the scenes shots, he's wearing glasses. So when they started doing their fight sequences, a lot of the times he just didn't know what he was doing. He couldn't, well, he couldn't see what he was doing. And some of the stunt guys were just amazed that he did so well, because they said, you know, he, shouldn't have, he, he, didn't, he couldn't see what he was doing. And there are a couple of scenes, I think, where he does hit a, hit a tree that's kind of made of balsa wood. And I think he had kind of a tree stuck on the end of his sword. And he was like, what is that? What's happening? What's this? Um, <laughs> But yeah, no. So, the, so some of the and in the fight sequences as well, in the battle sequence, they were some of the swords were actually real as well. So one of the extras I spoke to said that some of the swords were made of wood, but one of the ones he had was stamped with a very old symbol on it. I think it was I don't know, hundred maybe hundred years old or something. And uh, and he said you just had to be really careful because safety wasn't always a priority because there were so many people on set filming that battle sequence. They couldn't always, um, you know, health and safety these days would be very different. Mm. Uh, whereas then they were kind of hitting each other or hitting their, their um, uh, what's the word, shields and things. Whereas maybe they shouldn't have been so violent with them. Um, so no, I think there was, health and safety wise is really the most I have in the book about what they were doing with the swords. But sadly, I don't have all details on the, the claymores and things like that. No, I said I, just, I had my request on the way in, so I have to bring it up. But <laughs> Claymore was like—I thought Claymore was like the mace. Maybe it is. Oh no, it was Claymore the, the big ass sword that like the Kurgan has. I, I think that was the idea. Yeah, anyway, yeah. he yeah. has got a very cool sword. <laughs> I remember when when I first started the film last night, and the first fight in the car park. Part of me was thinking like, "Here we go. This is before Hollywood knew how to choreograph fights." But by the end of the film, I was fully invested in the the sword battling. I think it's just that the weird choice to start the film with a sword fight against a middle-aged man who just doesn't look threatening. <laughs> no, for me, I just, I read an article shortly before watching this where they talked about how actual sword play, the, the idea is to have as little contact with the sword as possible. Yeah, that's why you have a shield instead, right? Right, right, right. So when I saw, you know, the, the Kurgan's like, do it sparks, oh, you're killing the sword. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's con- I, I love the spark effects when the swords... Oh, hit. it's great it's, for the it's effect. Power Rangers I just, I just learned how, how swords actually work in that regard. This. It's like, no, don't do that. Well, I think yeah. the Kurgan sword sh- wouldn't work in real life. I have... I, I think that's a fact. that they, they, It looks good because he's in the hotel room putting it together. Right. But in reality, that would have been a terrible sword because I think it would have fallen apart very quickly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not even clamped in. He just puts it on and then starts swinging it around. So it's <laughs> like it should have flung off straight away. <laughs> but it is a cool scene, yeah. In this wilderness, God doesn't answer our prayers and cries, except through grace and miracles. We are here alone, yet we're here together. I see it now. We can't look to the stars for answers, while on the ground work is to be done. We need to go the distance ourselves, where past and future doesn't matter. There is only now to awake and create the dream. The end result does not matter. Um, I'm going to switch up the conversation a little bit now into a topic, and I'll, I'll just start off with the, who wants to live forever? Currently, I'm single. 
So like, yeah, fine. I want to live forever. Because you're single. Well, I, I, I don't really care if any of you die. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's There's how, no one I'm that bothered about losing right now. That's so. how that's how a real immortal speaks, right? <laughs> eventually, that's how you're all going to sound, right? Forget about her. <laughs> yeah. You have to leave her, boy. <laughs> Do you have people giving you that advice? You're not immortal yet. Yeah, exactly. Right? Or at least you haven't found out yet. Yeah, you got to get I killed mean, once before you find out. When do, when, when do you figure... If you don't get, like, stabbed or anything, when do you notice that you're immortal? When you're, like, 80 and you look like you're 20, I guess? Yeah, but I, like, I was 20 and I like I was 40, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, suppose Connor was supposed to be, I think, t- let's say, maybe 20 in the film. So I think he was aging properly until he gets killed. Yeah, that's that was my sort of headcanon that I made for why they look different ages. Ah. Uh-huh. I guess they look the age of when they first die. Exactly. So if he, if he did live, like, if he got to 80 and then was hit by a car... He would be an eighty-year-old immortal because I guess Sean Connery's character is Ramirez is is older, isn't he? Mm. Um, but yeah, I think in the TV series, I think I, I mean I don't really watch much of the TV show, but there was I think a child immortal, okay, because they were I think killed as a like nine-year-old or something. Right. So that when they are frozen in time, almost as a nine-year-old, uh, which is I guess. I think that's the that's the, one of the cool things about the TV show that they do have that area they can expand and explore the the, the world of the immortals a bit more and what it means to be an immortal and um, whereas the film is obviously a bit more limited. Now I know why they made an anime. Why is that? Oh, she looks like an eight-year-old girl, but she's actually two thousand years old, so it's fine. Because <laughs> animes love pulling that shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Oh, I lost my thought again. Okay, keep. Uh, you, 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 just, you, you, raised, that you, you just made everyone like never want to have a thought again. <laughs> what should I have? Should I share some more of my thoughts that I don't really want to have? <laughs> um, the one bit of this film that I legit really didn't like is when, right before the third act, for no real reason, just to give a bit more motivation to the fight, he just drops the fact that he raped Heather. It doesn't. Oh, right. the, it doesn't impact her characterization at all. She is purely she's been victimized to give Connor some extra motivation. Mm. That's real shitty. Yeah, that's, that's like some <laughs> shitty misogynistic writing, <laughs> and it's such a throwaway scene. Like you, that should just be cut out of future showings of this film. It adds nothing. Yeah, I guess it's when when the story is very compelling and you know most of it clicks. Those couple little things tend to stick out a little more sometimes. Yeah, I mean it's a film from nineteen eighty six, so <laughs> written pretty clearly by a lot of dudes because there's very few female speaking roles in this. Yeah. There's two love interests and a prostitute. <laughs> oh, and an old woman. <laughs> like I, th- I think the TV series did have a few more roles of note as well. Yeah. But... One thing that does work here is, I guess, the vagueness of the immortality works here because in the sequel they unfortunately tried to explain that. <laughs> right? Doesn't, doesn't the second one get into some aliens and shit? It gets totally wild. Yeah. Doesn't which, the third one then ignore the second one? Yeah, it's a direct sequel. It goes Terminator <laughs> style. Uh, another yep. Terminator parallel there, I guess. <laughs> yeah, the sequel. I mean, I watched Highlander two recently, the Renegade cut, which is Russell Mulcahy's edit. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's just not a very good film. I mean, some of the, the effects are fantastic. There are some really nice visuals in the film, but um, watching the fight sequences, bizarrely, they're just quite slow. Um, a couple of them are just, it's just guys, you can clearly tell they're, they're choreographed, uh, which of course we all know they all are, but in some of these fight sequences, it just felt like they were really literally just going through the motions, just sort of, you know, left, right, left. Yeah, okay, we're a bit bored now. It just wasn't... So that, that that's annoying. That's that's a shame. But um, <clears throat> like Chris Will Amber always said that that film, he said, I think he... Was it that film? I think when he was promoting that film, he said to people, don't... If you think this is a sequel to Highlander, then don't... Then it isn't. You're wrong. It's Don't go and see it if you think it's a sequel. <laughs> I don't know. There's a very nice and the producer said to me, you can't say that to people. He says, well, it's true. He says, it's not you know, aliens and what is all that? So he, he just didn't like it, but he was committed to it. He was, it was in his contract. He had to do it. So did he go back for the third? He did. Yeah. I think he did four in total. 
Okay. Um, Endgame, I thought, was actually a bit better than the, the other two. That was a cross. That was like a, a TV series crossover type thing. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me, but um, but yeah, yeah, the TV series was was uh, well as we've said already, it's very popular. But the films just they didn't have much luck with the films. Um, yeah, to me, I, I don't know how true this is, but I've always heard this is one where it's like, oh yeah, watch Highlander and then stop. <laughs> Yeah, there's a great little there's a little cartoon which people have shared with me a few times, and I think it's like a dad and his son ducks for some reason. Maybe it's maybe maybe it's like one of the, a long running series. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, but they, I think the little boy says, "I loved Highlander." Um, are there any sequels? And his dad just looks at him and says, "No." <laughs> uh, I've I've seen the same joke for Matrix as well. <laughs> yeah, it's probably. I think they probably just change out the type. The maybe, yeah, could be. <laughs> but it's, it's it's true though. Yeah, the sequels. You never have to watch the sequels. Um, but at the same time, you know, I have watched, you know, sometimes I'll put them on and it's, I don't know, I think it's that character of Connor that I think if you, you know, I think, I think we're probably fans of Connor, or at least we, you kind of, of course you want to see what happens to that character, but it's just a shame that nothing much good happens. (laughs) It's just the (laughs) films are not good. Yeah. It's a funny one. Yeah. He's definitely likable and watchable. And like we were talking about with his accent, he's just so unlike anyone else I see in films. He's unique to watch. Except the guy that gave me a tour of the Louvre. Was he in a film? No, he's in my. <laughs> he's in the film on my mind. <laughs> uh, also, Connor's hair at the start looked awful. Like his Highlander hair does not suit his forehead. Oh, oh okay. Once he has his bangs, he looks okay. But when it's just, he looks like. Um, what's the Hulk villain called? Oh, the leader. Yeah, he looks like the leader. He's just got the big forehead. It looks like. But yeah, once he has a proper modern head, though, he looks okay. <laughs> um, well, let's let's talk about the Highlander in the year twenty twenty. I guess it's more of a niche thing now. But again, I, I was pretty familiar with the mythos or the fandom, but actually came to this pretty fresh. And yeah, I, I quite enjoyed watching it. So, which is good. I didn't, you know watch him and be like oh my god what did i get myself into so (laughs) if i put my real like lefty i'm gonna kick off about things glasses on (laughs) then i could definitely pick a lot of holes with this film right but uh, that's not how you watch a 1986 action film like this yeah like it what you want to see it delivers you've got sword fights you've got absolute nonsense you've got (laughs) a great villain a likable hero and you've got sean connery just having the time of his life. <laughs> so, um, cause I, like I said, I watched it as a kid and in the intervening years, I think my dad must've gotten up, gotten bored of it because in my head I'd heard, all I'd heard is people saying like, oh, it's actually not that good. It's a bit of a crap film, but going back and watching it, no, oh, it's a good fun film. Yeah. Um, on, on our podcast, we talk about sometimes it takes me like a week to watch a film, but so for me saying I knocked it out in two nights is actually a pretty good praise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, your attention span is like what your generation said was going to happen to my generation has happened to you. <laughs> I've started watching more films over the course of the week as well. Uh, especially with streaming. I think it helps because you can just go back on and resume. Um, I'm trying to watch uh, A Star is Born just now, the James Mason, Judy Garland one. Right gnarly because it's on bbc iplayer just now and it's about three i don't know two and a half hours long and i think oh i just can't i can't sit through that so i just kind of watch half an hour a day and <laughs> get there in the end you're giving me flashbacks to when um because my brother is eight years younger than me so he only ever knew dvds and he watched one of my films on vhs and we went back to it the next day and he's like luke it remembers where we are <laughs> <laughs> that's cool yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, I, just you were saying there about about what sort of um, eyes you view it through. I think yes. If, I mean, I used to review. I don't know. Uh, yes, if you're looking at it in a sort of alongside Citizen Kane or uh, you know um, art house films, then of course it's it's a terrible film probably. But we're not. We we all. I think you just. Of course, we all judge films based on the genre and the time, and you have to just shift your your perspective so 
but I, the, well, a lot of people do tell me they can't they just don't like it and they, they watch it and it's terrible and I, that, and that's the funny thing i think you can i can see that i can watch it and think yeah i can i can see why you would think it was terrible and it kind of is terrible but it's also brilliant <laughs> well, it's one of those you've got to have a for me a film which clearly reached much further than it could actually achieve and maybe failed is much more in, enjoyable than a film which was just not ambitious at all which just comfortably did what it could do like um it got to the point with the marvel movies where it's just like they were all good but they weren't doing anything new and i was kind of like i kind of prefer the dc nonsense at this point because look at the mad things they're trying to <laughs> convince me is a good film, right? We've said a few times, just, you know, being passionate about the work you're doing. Not being good at it, necessarily. The people doing the Marvel films are all very good. But, you know, maybe there's people like a little more work a day here. Where, yeah. you, you know, the people making a movie like, like this are a little more hungry, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, it's the difference between, like, Attack of the Clones and Empire Strikes Back, right? <laughs> Yeah, and there were a lot of young people making this film. I mean, that's the that's other, I think, interesting thing that Russell Mulcahy, the director, was, um, you know, he was an MTV music video director. I mean, he'd done a couple, he'd done Razorback by this point, but really he cut his teeth doing music videos. So he was in his twenties. I think he was maybe twenty four ish, uh, and he, the people he was working with, like Jerry Fisher, who was the cinematographer, was maybe in his. 40s maybe at that time so there was just this real clash all the way through it i think between the old guard the old let's say the old british film um stalwarts and the new guys coming along russell Mackay and some of the younger guys that were working with them and they were you know russell would come in with his crazy camera angles and um pyrotechnics and uh um and just throwing things throwing weird things into the scene, like uh, hubcaps would go rolling by, and that was him just standing there off screen, rolling a, a hubcap across. And the old guys were like, what are you doing? This is terrible. You can't do this. You can't have rain inside an underground car park. Um, and Russell was like, no, it'll work. It'll work. And sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. But at least he was trying. Like you're saying, he was he was trying to do something different and new and fresh. And um, overall, I think he succeeds. Well, am I right in saying that the original script was written when the writer was still in college? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. he was only 21, I think. Because there are definitely there are elements of the film where it's like, yeah, this is the film I'd have written when I was 19. It's like, it's a cool guy who's a playboy, in, immortal, with a samurai sword <laughs> fighting like this. I think one of the first things she said to me when I met you was, I'm writing a samurai novel. <laughs> <laughs> You are correct. <laughs> <laughs> How's that coming along? <laughs> uh, it, 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 I finished it, but now I'm getting a little bit of cold feet about whether it's really culturally insensitive. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, listeners, if you want to read my samurai novel, hit me up on Twitter. It's <laughs> moving into space, man. I, I, I also wrote Dirty Dancing, but in space. <laughs> that is still online, I think. I'll send you the link. <laughs> Uh, before too much time runs away from us, uh, unlike the Immortals, are there any other big points that uh, any of you guys want to bring up on this movie? Is this, uh, something to get off your chest? I, we said Sean Connery so many times. Just the, the music, I suppose. Yeah, as well, I'll say we need to shout out Freddie Mercury once or twice, and the other dudes in Queen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, and also just the fact that there t there's a talk of rebooting it. Um, I don't know what you guys think of that. I mean, personally, I think go for it. I mean... Um, the, the, the original exists and always will. Uh, we've got that. So what's what's the harm in trying again? And yeah, I feel like they there was it was almost rebooted in the form of um, the Jet Li film, The One. Is a, is kind of a similar premise. So I definitely think a Highlander made today with modern like fight choreography and maybe a, a I don't think they need to change much other than just do it with a bit more money. And with the lessons that have been learned in the intervening years. And like you say, the old, the original's not going anywhere. I very rarely am I one of these guys who's like, I can't believe they're making a remake. So I don't, I, I feel like it will not have the soul that this one has. I think it's very unlikely that we're going to get a new Highlander, which is in the same wheelhouse as this one. But I very much want to see it. 
I feel like it would go better in the uh, Verhoeven remakes here, your Robocops and Total Recalls, which, uh, to be honest, I didn't completely hate as much as everyone else, but I feel like there is a little more space here to grow on. No, because this film, it's not like this film has loads to say, mm. other than aren't sword fights cool. <laughs> so, you, you know, you can't, like, there's no message to get wrong. So I feel like it's just, like, if you find a guy who just really likes filming dudes having sword fights in New York City, then you're going to probably get a good Highlander film. <laughs> well, I, I, at the moment, it's the team behind John Wick films that are due to bring this back. Uh, Chad Stahelski is due to due to direct it. I mean, it does change every few years. Someone else has announced, but he's been with it for a long time. Well, that makes sense because Keanu Reeves is immortal. So. <laughs> there you go. And I think, I mean, if you watch, of course, if we, we've all watched the uh, what they can do with with guns, and, and I think in the final, in the third film, there is a bit of sword work. There's some ninjas. I can't remember if there was much sword play, but there must have been a bit. But um, I just, I think they could do amazing things. It could look look gorgeous. Um, and the, 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 yeah, I think, and also just because with that first, the original Highlander, they didn't plan sequels. They didn't know what the world should be. And then they had to try and make it up as they went along and retrofit it. This mm. time they've got a chance to actually build the world first, you know, build that world, give us the, the new, the new corner and, um, and just make it into something that actually deserves to be over a trilogy or. Um, yeah. I, I can imagine if we get a new one, it's not going to end with anyone getting the prize. Probably, yeah. Which is why I would quite like to see it as a Netflix thing or an Amazon thing. Mm. Uh, I think it deserves... This is actually... I'm, I'm copying what uh, I think Chris Will Lambert said to me, something about he would like to see it as, as a Netflix show. Because you can just tell it in, in chapters and you could just do so many fantastic things with... And I think the whole jumping back and forth in time... Mm-hmm. Work would work so well in a in a TV show because you just got you could dedicate like episode three to Samurai, let's say, or episode four could just be set on a a ship in the 16th century or something, and then you come back to the present. You could just do amazing things. Whereas a film, of course, you're just limited to 90 minutes. So well, these days it's more like 150 minutes. But <laughs> well, that's true. But, uh, but no, I, I hope I hope there is a remake, uh, partly so I can try and go and see them filming it in Scotland if they if they come back here, which they have oh, to. Okay. If they're going to call it Highlander, be pretty cheeky if they don't. <laughs> I mean, we've got Highlands here. It could just all be samurai. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had my friend go up to Knott's Island today. A whoopie woodpecker, a Mayan raft ride. A little different than the one here. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's... Uh... <laughs> I got some photos from him. <laughs> um, anyway... If you've gotten this far through a Highlander podcast, you're definitely going to want to have a look at um, your book, Jonathan. Can you tell all of our listeners a little bit, give, give them the uh, the full rundown on your new book? Yeah, well, I think I've mentioned that a few times, so people are probably bored of hearing, but it's called A Kind of Magic, Making the Original Highlander. And uh, and yeah, I, I take people from the moment that Greg Wyden, who, who wrote the first script, had that first idea in the Tower of London, in 1980, 1980, 1979, 80, um, right through to kind of 2020, really. Um, and just like I've said all the way through, you know, just try to take people into every scene of the film, really, and behind the scenes. And, um, you know, just showing what was going on behind, who was standing behind a wall, pulling the wall down when they were fighting in front of the wall, and uh, who was... Um, you know, who was the guy that did the backflips in the underground car park? I actually found him because uh, he wasn't the guy who was the, the stunt man in the film. <laughs> you, I love the way it cuts from the guy doing the backflips to the fat old man running. <laughs> <laughs> so I managed to track down him. Uh, the guy who plays the barman in New York and just says, what you have, Brenda? I spoke to him. Um, so, you know, I kind of went a deep dive here, really, so... Um, if you're an obsessive like I kind of am, then I hope you'll enjoy it. I might buy my dad a copy for his birth for Christmas, only for him to not read it and for me to steal it in a year's time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just, just to throw out, I, I had a look at the cover, and the, the cover artwork is fantastic. Yeah, the Scottish flag with the hand, it was pretty cool. <laughs> oh, I know it was clever. It's a friend of mine, Ben, Ben Morris, uh, who does a lot of art for Doctor Who magazine here in oh, the nice. UK. Uh, and he did the, the Tremors cover as well. And... Um, yeah, he only watched the film once. I said, could you do me a cover? He said, I've never seen Highlander. And he watched <laughs> it once and he did that. And that was the first draft, really. Amazing. Nice. 
It worked. It looked pretty well for our eyes. So, um, uh, last one. Luke, how about for people? You, you you do that thing. I'll just like shut up and let you do that thing. Okay, if you like our podcast, you can find us on Twitter at MLSFS Pod. We're also on Facebook and Apple Podcasts and YouTube. Just search Matt Luke Sci-Fi Sanctuary. If you want to hear more of my voice, you can hear my other podcasts. I do a Pokemon one, which you can find on Twitter at Luke Plus PKMN. I do a Monster Hunter podcast where you can hear more Scottish voices, which you can find on Twitter at Monster Mash Pod. If you've liked the music you've heard during this podcast, you can find Matt's music at rovingstagemedia.bandcamp.com. Side effects will be listed later. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so you get through all those letters. It's so so pretty. I hate I hate <laughs> myself every time I do it. <laughs> I'm such a shill. <laughs> anyway, Jonathan, once again, very uh, we're very happy to have you chatting to us here because that's just uh, such as Trevor Trevor Trove treasure trove of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> we would we we had a much deeper conversation with you than we would have without you, and it was great. Thank you. Yeah, oh. <laughs> We had such a deep and intelligent conversation, I didn't even say the stupid thing I wanted to say. Go for it. Highlander's basically just a millennia-long game of Fortnite. <laughs> <laughs> there, oh, you said it before you recorded, didn't you? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Well, thanks for having me on. It's been, it's been great to talk about this and, um, and our time differences. I hope, I, hope you don't, I hope you get your train because I realise that the time difference here is crazy, but... No, I'm going to. I've, I've got everything in mind. I'm taking more of a walk, but I usually take that walk on Saturdays anyway. Just not quite as late as I'm going to tonight. So it's all cool. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> oh, it was great. It was, yeah. Like like Matt said, this is a much better Highlander podcast than the two of us would have recorded on our own. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, for those listeners of the podcast, Luke. Yeah, Jonathan, you and the listeners at home, and unfortunately one of us, is going to have to leave tonight because there can be only one. In this apartment? Yeah. That's you. Okay. Oh, yeah. Man, you, you win so, the big As soon prize. as you're out that door, I'm, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, man. <laughs> Discovered country.